Okay, so uh, we're coming to the third part, the last part, on how the chordate got its chord. Let me just, uh, uh, this is sort of a just-so story, you know, where we're going to tell you all the little features that arose in, uh, in the animals in the course of evolution that we could, couldn't normally see, but are revealed by homologies uh, in the molecular details. In the first part, I told you essentially that the um, anterior-posterior axis of the hemichordate, which is a sister phylum to the chordates, was very, very similar to the chordate anterior-posterior axis. In the second lecture, I showed you that the basic patterning mechanism of the dorsal-ventral axis was the same, but the details were very different. And I, dem and I argued, based on a lot of evidence, that the idea that Geoffroy St. Hilaire had and Eddie de Robertis more, more, much more recently in the uh, late 20th century had uh, of an inversion was basically correct. That is, there has been an inversion of the nervous system and the mouth relative to a conserved body plan. And now in this lecture, I want to deal with the, the fundamental patterning mechanism of chordate development that is the spamon organizer and the way in which the, uh, the chordate body uh, is generated. And one of the primary structures which is generated there is uh, a, an anatomical structure called the notochord, which also signals many other structures and organizes them in the course of development. And there's no, or it didn't seem to be, any obvious precedent for the notochord and the signaling aspects of the spamon organizer in uh, invertebrate development. So it's a real question, a real mystery. How do we get our chord? So the, let's we go back to the Spamon experiment in vertebrate specific development. This is an experiment done in uh, the 1920s by Spamon and Mongold. And uh, it was an uh, experiment that um, was the most famous experiment in the history of, of, of of developmental biology, maybe in, is still in the history of developmental biology. And the basic experiment was that uh, they knew that one part of the egg or the early embryo would generate the belly and one part of the early embryo would generate the back. And they took a little bit of tissue in the, in the uh, uh, gastral stage of the early embryo just um, uh, when, when there's not, no structures are obviously apparent. And they moved this tissue, which was from the back, just a little bit of it, onto a, a, onto a recipient embryo and put it on its belly. And then the embryo developed. And what they sort of half expected, undoubtedly, was that that tissue might or might not revert to belly uh, features, or it might form a little piece of the, of the back on the belly. But the result was very striking. It produced conjoint twins transforming the belly tissue into an entire embryo, including the central nervous system and the somites and the notochord and all those things you can see in the bottom of the histological section, a mirror image of the other side. And most of those tissues, almost all those tissues, arose from tissues that were re-specified by uh, some sort of signal that came from this transplanted tissue. So that seemed to be, that transplanted tissue must have been really very, very special. We actually now know that it was, though it is special, it really is special in eliciting an existing response from the surrounding tissues, which are normally repressed from forming the, the body axis. So the body axis could form anywhere, and this is a local region of derepression. So okay, but anyways, so, and this tissue, this signaling tissue, gives rise to the notochord. So the notochord is, uh, contains signaling elements, but it also is an anatomical structure that derives from that tissue. And since the notochord is the, is the uh, iconic structure of uh, a vertebrate, uh, we want to know where it came from. How did it arise? So what about the notochord? The crux of Bateson's argument, remember Bateson was this guy who studied the uh, beautiful studies of hemichordates in the 1880s and then went on to become a famous geneticist. He argued that the hemichordate was essentially a chordate. And so, and he based it on the fact that the structure, 
which is now called a stoma cord, was in fact a notochord. Well, we've looked. And we've looked for all these characteristic genes that are found in the, the notochord. Cordon, which we've talked a lot about. Noggin, ADMP, brachyuri, hedgehog. And we have a small problem, as they say. They're not in the notochord. They're, and they're not absent from the animal, they're just somewhere else. So it doesn't have a, so the notochord, the stoma cord, is clearly not a notochord, at least by all those criteria. Well, all right, now the notochord is the product of the Spamon organizer. And the Spamon organizer, as we said, is something that signals many, many different types of tissues. So we maybe should still ask the question, does it have a Spamon organizer? Because it is, the Spamon organizer, as I said, is a complex signaling center. And if we look at these uh, genes that are present in the region of the notochord, of the stoma cord before it actually forms, such as FOXE2 or DMBX or OTX, these genes, which are involved in signaling, are present in the right place in the right time. So the interpretation is that even though the stoma card is not a notochord, as a signaling center, it has an organizer. And this is, uh, now we, what is really the organizer? Well, we know a lot more about the organizer than we did in Spamon's time. And uh, we know that it's really a tripartite structure formed of three kinds of signaling centers that is shown here in the frog picture that are pasted together and held together and worked together in the vertebrate embryo. There's a, a trunk tail organizer. This is the part that gives rise to the notochord. Then there's a head organizer that gives rise to the brain and to the tissues on, uh, sur surrounding the brain. And then finally, there's an anterior endomesodermal organizer that gives rise to very anterior tissues and things also in the mesoderm. And in the vertebrate, these get stretched out and pulled in all sorts of directions, but held in some adjacency. Well, what kind of an organizer does the hemichordate have? Well, it doesn't have the trunk tail organizer. Even though it has these genes, that trunk, those trunk tail genes are never associated with the stomachord structure. Instead, it has some of the genes, maybe most of the genes, that are found in the head organizer and in the end of the mesodermal organizer. What basically we're saying is that the organizer as we know it, this tripartite structure, was assembled from separate organizers, which are now somewhat separate, and sometimes completely separate, in the, uh, in the uh, hemichordate. So, for example, if we look at brachyuri, which is the classic trunk organizer, uh, it's present near the, near the uh, posterior end and remains posterior in the whole course of, the, of development. If we look at guscoid, which is a typical uh, anterior uh, uh, pre uh, precordal uh, mesoderm organizer, uh, that organizes the anterior part of the embryo and, and, and induces part of the brain and that sort of thing. It's present in the stomach cord region as well as uh, and, and stays in the region that we would expect it. And, and uh, uh, HEX, which is a gene in the very endomesodermal organizer, it also stays in, in those sorts of structures as well. So what can we conclude about the basic organizer, the Spamon organizer? The, the vertebrate organizer is in reality a composite of three signaling centers, which come together in the hemichordate. Two of them are already associated with each other in the hemichordate. That is the most anterior signaling centers. But the posterior signaling center, the one that gives rise to the trunk tail, is not associated with that same structure. And, Either it came apart or, in fact, most likely it was assembled together in the vertebrate lineage. The vertebrate organizer is very complex because it conflates dorsal ventral and anterior posterior signaling. The disaggregated hemichordate organizer corresponds to separate signaling centers 
in more primitive bilateral organisms. So we now can look at this basic body plan as quite simplified, the hemichordate, but having all the features that we hope to try to explain in the chordate. First of all, it has this dorsal ventral asymmetry. That is the BMP chordon gradient, and which really is, uh, and that is fundamental. And what's happened underneath all that has been reorganization of the mouth and nervous system. But the really fundamental signaling pathways were already there and present not only in the hemichordate but in more primitive animals and all the way up through vertebrates. In the AP dimension, I've talked mostly about uh, you know, the detailed underlying patterning genes, but which I haven't talked about, which we have very good evidence for, is a, a cascade of Wnt genes and, ant, and uh, inhibitors of Wnt genes, which are placed in the animal just as they are really in the, um, in the, in the chordate. That is, Wnt's that are very posterior, Wnt's that are present at the midbrain and hindbrain boundary, uh, Wnt's that are uh, present uh, somewhere in between, and also, uh, also inhibitors of the Wnt pathway, the signal-related, uh, uh, secreted frizzled-related proteins shown in pink which also tend to sharpen and limit the uh, Wnt pathway, and the DKK, or dkop like proteins, which also limit the Wnt pathway. So this basic Wnt int is a uh, signaling uh, pattern, uh, mechanism, which I haven't talked about, lays out the basic AP axis, anterior-posterior axis, and BMP lays out the dorsal-ventral axis. And in the vertebrate lineage, there's a specific relationship with the, these two axes and uh, the presence of nodal on, uh, on the left side of vertebrates and on the right side of hemichordates. So now not only can we begin to explain, uh, you know, with some level of certainty, but certainly not complete certainty, where, how the basic features of the chordate body plan arose and where they came from. But we can also extrapolate backwards to begin to see what was common with this body plan and the body plan that is uh, demonstrated in other invertebrate organisms like flies and annelids and, and, uh, and, and such things to get a glimpse of what that first bilateral animal must have looked like around 600 million years ago. And here we have a picture of it. It's not, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's only a drawing, it's not a real picture, but it, it has the features that this animal must have had that, so that it could, these things could be maintained, preserved so, and so, uh, with such high fidelity in all these other lineages. Well, what did it have? Well, it, it may have had a centralized nervous system ventrally, that's what's shown here, or it may have had a delocalized nervous system that went essentially around the body. It would have had a fairly complete set of Hox genes, which, uh, which kind of pattern the anterior-posterior axis. And this patterning would have been done, would have been generated via a Wnt pathway, uh, as it is in, in so many animals. And it would have had a dorsal-ventral axis, where it had a dorsal heart, just like the invertebrates, uh, like Drosophila, uh, which would have been sitting up on a BMP-rich side of the animal, and a ventral anti-BMP pattern, uh, pattern, which was uh, where, the, uh, where, the mouth, where the mouth is located in this animal. Uh, there are some images in the fossil record of uh, burrows in the mud of an animal about a millimeter in size, and that may have been, but no, no uh, fossilized remains of the animal itself. So this may be the animal that uh, was burrowing through the mud uh, before the major Cambrian explosion. So one of the questions I wanted to get, get back to to summarize is what is unique to chordates? Everyone wants to know what's unique about themselves. 
Some people are concerned with what's unique about them as individuals. Some people are concerned about what's unique of them as a, a, a nation or uh, as a religious group. And I, I'm much broader in my feeling. I'm happy to know what's unique about us chordates. I really relate to all of them and, and, and stand up as a chordate chauvinist and, 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 rel, and, and wallow in our accomplishments over the last uh, 530 million years. So what can we really be proud of? Well, we, we, had, we inverted our dorsal, our, our dorsal ventral axis. We moved our mouth to the opposite ventral side. We centralized our nervous system to the dorsal side. And I don't, I don't know why we did any of those things, but those are our accomplishments. Uh, along with that, we centralized the mesoderm to the dorsal side. We evolved the notochord from the gut midline and concentrated all these structures by conversion extension. And we clustered antagonists of BMP and Wnts into the notochord and endomesoderm to form an organizer. As we took all these separate signaling centers, we packed them together in a group of cells that was going to stretch out and move through the animal during its development. Well, I'd like to um, thank all of you for listening to this. I think uh, it's been a historical talk in the sense that we've uh, tried to recreate the history of our, our uh, phylum and even beyond that to our whole superphylum of the deuterostomes. Um, and I'd like to talk a little for a moment about the evolution of this project because it came about uh, really three people who got together for an intense month of work and then subsequent work during the course of the year at Woods Hole, Massachusetts in, in the Marine Biological Laboratory. And I'm very indebted to the, their facilities and their support over there for making this all possible. Uh, John Gerhard, who's a professor at UC Berkeley, who's done a lot of work on vertebrate embryology, and myself, he and I have worked together for a long time, as I mentioned in the introduction. Um, and Chris Lowe, who is a, a very independent postdoc, who's now a faculty member at the University of Chicago. And this was done um, on the cheap, in a sense. We didn't have any grants for this, and we did it in the spare money we could get together but with a lot of help from our friends. And it turned out there were people who recognized this was an interesting thing to do and provide us with all sorts of help. So I want to just sort of uh, go through a few of these people. At Harvard Medical School, Kristen Kwan, who was a student, did a lot of work with us in the summers. Bob Freeman did bioinformatics, absolutely essential to try to interpret these genes. At Berkeley, Mike Wu did a lot of the molecular biology, the, the technician there. At the University of Chicago, the following uh, Yoki Aronowicz, Imogene Hurley, Steve Green, Marcin Wazilla, and Ellen Fairley were graduate students and um, technicians there who uh, came for some summers and contributed a great deal to this work. And then to do this molecular uh, analysis, the basic idea, as I said, was to just to get a list of genes and look through them and say, these are the ones we want to look at. And uh, so I want to just basically point out that uh, Eric Lander and Nicole Stronger Thurman at, uh, at uh, MIT uh, did the EST project for us. We had some real help from Chris Gruber at Express Genomics and making libraries. And the microinjection of these eggs, even though they're quite big, they're very difficult to microinject. And the most successful people at it, the ones who contributed so much, were Mark Terasaki and Rachel Norris and Michelle Rue. So this has been um, a village project and uh, I think everybody just sort of felt it was worth putting the efforts into something that was a little bit unusual. So thanks very much.